Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the definition of a group. Okay, so, what I've discussed is if we're going to build a group, what we start off by doing is creating a set of symbols here, okay, and then we define a single composition law on this set of symbols, okay, so we define what any combination of two elements within this set composed with one another is, basically. So we define uh, for an arbitrary little x and an arbitrary little y what x composed with y is equal to. So that means defining uh, all of the entries in this composition table, basically. We've got all of the elements of the group here, all of the elements of the group here, and you need to go through and put answers in into these nine uh, sockets, basically. Okay, now, in order for that composition table to be considered a group, it has to obey certain properties, the first of which is closure, okay, so uh, the answers that you put in have to be answers within the group, basically. You can't have some new symbol, zeta, suddenly popping up, which wasn't originally in your group, so it does need to obey closure, okay. Secondly, it needs to obey this associative property, which is that when you compose three things together, that has an answer, basically, and it doesn't matter where you put the brackets, okay, because obviously this composition law only tells you how to compose two elements together, so when you're composing three elements together, you have to split it up using brackets, and basically associativity tells you that it doesn't matter where you put the brackets, and I've told you about how that is not a trivial property at all, okay, and the way that you can actually build a composition table that does have that property is by letting um, the symbols within your uh, group um, represent permutations of some other set, okay, and then the composition law needs to be the composition of those set permutations to get another set permutation which should uh, have a symbol and be within your group, okay. You want, obviously, uh, the two set permutations to compose together to give a set permutation that is in your group. If it doesn't, then obviously you're not going to get closure being obeyed, okay, so that's important. Alright, so associativity was the second axiom that it needed to obey, and then uh, the third axiom that we've seen is that you need to have an identity element, an element which will compose with any other arbitrary element of the group, little g, to give back that little g, and again on the other side, little g compose with uh, e will equal little g, basically. And what that really means in terms of uh, our set permutation understanding of what the elements of a group really are representing is that one element of your group needs to actually be the identity set permutation, the map which sends every element of that set onto itself, basically. And we know that that set permutation will compose with any other set permutation to just give that other set permutation uh, back again, whether you put it on the left here or on the right here, basically, it doesn't matter. Okay, right, uh, so that's the identity element. The final, the fourth and final axiom that uh, uh, the composition law of a group has to obey, number four here, is that you need to have inverses. Okay, now, as I did with the um, identity, I'll firstly just write out symbolically what it means to have inverses, and then I'll go over the intuition of what really this means. Okay, in terms of our understanding of the elements of a group as representing set permutations. Okay, so just symbolically, the way that you would write this is that this means that if you take any little g, so for all, let's put a little bit of fancy maths um, symbols in, so for all upside down a here, little g is an element of big G. So you take any element of the group you like, any symbol within the group you like, uh, there must exist Okay, there exists another element which we'll call g inverse, which we'll call the inverse of little g. Okay, so g to the power of negative 1, this means just the inverse of g. Okay, such that g composed with g inverse this way is equal to the identity, and also g inverse composed with g the other way is equal to the identity. Now, I'll just get another piece of paper and then I'll put on the composition table what this means. Or I suppose I could put it on this composition table here, in fact I will do that. So basically what this says is that there must exist another element 
Little g inverse now, it's important to understand that sometimes an element will be its own inverse. So sometimes little g inverse will actually be little g, okay? Uh, but let's assume that little g inverse is not g and it does have a separate element within the group that is its inverse, okay? And basically then, what this um, these rules say is that little g composed with g inverse, which is this one here, okay, so little g here, and then g inverse from here has to equal the identity. So this answer has to equal the identity. And also the other way around, g inverse composed with g, this entry here, so g inverse and then g here, this entry also has to equal the identity. So there has to equal some element of the group which can compose with g uh, both way rounds, basically, to give back the identity. Now, as I say, sometimes little g will be its own inverse, so you'll have, you'll com you can compose little g with itself and get the identity, okay, but not always. Okay, right. So all elements have an element which they can compose with to give you back the identity element, basically. Now, it's best instantly to go over to thinking in terms of set permutations to understand this, okay? Basically, what this is saying is that if you have a set permutation represented in your group, so you have some symbol representing a certain set permutation in your group, then you have to have the exact inverse map also represented somewhere within your group, basically, okay? So, with the examples that I have given you so far, in terms of the, um, in terms of the, firstly, that set where we just had two elements in it, A and B, and we were taking the two set permutations of that set, okay, so here, uh, then this example, inverses aren't a big thing, okay, because the identity map, it's its own inverse, obviously, because it will compose with itself to give the identity map. And transposition map, it's its own inverse as well, because if you compose the transposition map with itself, again, it will give you the identity map, okay? So let's go on to that other example I gave you of the integers, and then we'll see uh, how this has inverses, basically. Every element in the integers has an inverse, basically. Okay, so firstly, we know that zero represents the identity map. It represents uh, the map which takes every point here onto itself. Okay, let's now think of an arbitrary other element, so for instance, maybe plus one. Okay, and let's try and understand why that has an inverse. Well, plus one we know means move everything to the right by one. Okay, and we know then that there's also this element, negative one, which then moves everything to the left. And if we composed plus one with negative one, that would then give us the identity, which is uh, the zero um, well, the um, zero element here, the map that just sends everything to itself, because if you move everything to the right by one and then move everything back to the left by one, you overall move, the net effect is that you don't move anything, basically, everything's just mapped onto itself. Okay, right, so that negative one is the inverse of plus one, uh, in this case, basically. And what negative one really is, is if you think about plus one, if you think about this map that sends all of these points to the right by one, and then you just think about reversing the arrow. So you can see that plus one has all of these going like the this, the blue arrows here. They're all moving to the right by one. If you just think about reversing the arrows on all of these, okay, so turning it into the other way around, like so, okay, then that is the inverse map, basically. It's just taking everything backwards, back to the place where it was originally. Okay, and that will also be a set permutation, basically. So basically, what this criterion of inverses says is that if you have one set permutation represented within your group, you have to have the inverse map, where you just reverse everything, you send everything back to what it was. That also needs to be uh, represented within your group. It also also needs to have a symbol represented within your group, okay? So that's what this criterion of having inverses really means, that uh, if you have one set permutation represented within your group, the exact inverse map must also uh, be represented within that group. It will be a set permutation, as you can see here, okay? If one map, if, if, if a 
set permutation is a set permutation. If it's a bijection, then the inverse map will also be a bijection, and therefore it will also be a set permutation. Okay, and when you compose those two set permutations together, one with its inverse map, they will give the identity map, basically. Okay, whichever way around you compose them. Okay, so that's what this inverse criterion is really saying. It's saying that which or for all the set permutations you have, you must also have their inverses basically represented within your group. Okay, which indeed the integers does have. Uh, basically, if you take any arbitrary positive element plus one plus two plus three, the negative element is its inverse. Okay, so. A positive element just means move everything to the right by a certain amount. The negative one will say move everything to the left by that same amount, and they'll undo each other, basically. Okay, right. So that's the final axiom of group theory, that you need to have a closure under inversion, basically. The inverse elements also need to be represented within the group. Okay, so let's just go over briefly why the integers under addition obey this. Okay, so uh, they are a set. We've seen how they can be interpreted as representing the set permutations of this other set. Okay, we can use that to define this composition law called addition uh, on of these elements of this set. Okay, we know that it will be closed. Okay, because whenever you compose two set permutations of the form move everything to the right or left by a certain amount together, you'll always end up with another set permutation of the form move everything to the right or left by a certain amount. So whenever you compose any of these set permutations together, you'll always end up with another one that's represented in there. Okay, so we've got that it obeys closure. We know it will obey associativity because we can think of it in terms of composition of set permutations. Okay, we know we've got an identity element, that's the um, zero element, that maps all of these points onto themselves, okay, and that will therefore compose with any of the other elements of this set, uh, just to give those elements back again, okay, because the identity map will compose with any of the other set permutations to give that other set permutation back again, okay. It's also got inverses. Every element in here has an inverse, basically, which it can compose with on either side uh, to give back the identity map, basically, or the identity element. Okay, now note, nowhere in the axioms of group theory is there the statement that x composed with y must equal y composed with x. This property is called commutativity. Okay, so if the, um, if the composition law does obey this, then we say that the composition law obeys commutativity, or it obeys the commutative property. Okay, but that is not an axiom of group theory. We have now been through all four axioms of group theory, and this is not one of them. We do not insist that this is true. In the case of the integers, we know that it is true. In the case of the other little example I gave you, um, back on this page, it was true as well, okay? The composition law was symmetrical down that diagonal line, okay? But in other examples, it's not true. Other examples of groups, it's not true. And we in do not insist that that is true. So groups which do have this true are called commutative groups, or more commonly, they're called abelian groups, after the mathematician uh, Abel. Okay, so when people are talking about an abelian group, it just means a group where the composition law uh, is commutative, basically. Okay, where x composed of y is equal to y composed with x for any arbitrary little x and little y are an element of the group, basically. Okay, right. Uh, but as I say, not all groups are abelian groups. Right, so that now concludes our discussion of the definition of a group.